So goodbye, Yellow Brick Road, and welcome back to Still Abreast at the Movies after a rather long absence. What can we say? The January to February dead spot was a little deader than we thought it was this year. Yeah. But we are back today to kick off the year of 2023 movies with Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania. Now this is a movie that is has got a lot of hot pinned on it for the fact that it is Ant-Man ki finally kicking off a phase of the MCU. Usually he ends it, and he usually he, and usually when he ends it, it will technically be him where, winding things down a little bit after something particularly intense, whether it be the whether it be the world shaking epicness that was the that kind of was Age of Ultron, or the, or the, oh god, I'm so depressed, get me something lighthearted that was Infinity War. And in doing so, Ant-Man, and in doing so, Ant-Man kind of got pushed to the background, to the point that, that around, after Endgame came around, where Ant-Man was like one of the biggest factors in that movie, he came back, Paul, there was apparently rumors that Paul Rudd had to put out a, had to sort of start a fan campaign to get Ant-Man 3 made because there was no plans to work on Ant-Man much after Endgame. Of course, that wasn't true. Ant-Man will always be one of their biggest names, thanks to Paul Rudd, thanks to the incredible likableness of Paul Rudd. Uh, and of course, the fact that a fact that didn't dawn on me until I was get, watching a review of this movie yesterday, which was. Hawkeye can claim to be the the normal person amongst these gods and monsters, but at the end of the day, he still spent his entire adult life hanging out with these people. Ant-Man is the true only normal person in the MCU. He yeah. just kind of fell into it. Speaking of normal people <laughs> in the MCU... Yeah, we're doing it early this time. Just don't know if we're going to fit it in any other time. But... <laughs> But Ant-Man is the truly the only normal person because he's just a guy who kind of fell into the superhero life. And that's kind of the appeal of casting Paul Rudd, who, I'm just going to be honest, it's almost ten years later, and I am still shocked that Paul Rudd just kind of shows up, where it's just like, oh, there's Jeremy Renner, Chris Hemsworth, they fit in. What the fuck is... What the fuck is Brian Tam, Hamblin doing in here? Fantana, whatever. But, but yeah, it's weird that it's weird that Paul Rudd became sort of was at was at the, at the biggest upswing of his career, got the got the boost of being part of the MCU, and arguably that's the reason why why Paul Rudd can do more serious roles occasionally now. I'm not saying that he didn't do serious roles before because obviously Paul Rudd did a lot of stuff as an actor before doing Marvel movies, but it's but now if people are like, oh, Paul Rudd's not just a comedy guy, we can kind of put him in places. Yeah. And of course, Paul Rudd's not alone in this movie. Obviously, there's... You know, it would be nice if some of these superhero actors would just keep being an anti-vaxxer under their hats. If they would just... If people would just kind of shut up about how they were brainwashed by propagandists who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. But... The fact that Evangeline Lilly not only he is proud anti-vaxxer, but is also but is going to the rallies, and she's very, although in the public eye she's very much a hypocrite because she is vaccinated and undergoes COVID safety protocols. Though of course the fact is she's not she's what, probably worse than most anti-vaxxers who are like don't get the vaccine it's evil. She's a do your own research anti-vaxxer, which is bad. Because the trust anti -va people who are typically anti-vax to actually do credible research and not just stop at the article that reaffirms their own personal bias. So yeah, there's that. Which, uh, like we did with Black Panther: Wakanda Forever, we are gonna try to separate her her role in the movie from the fact that she is just kind of a shitty person. But I'm just really. But when that came out, I was just really like. So she's just gonna like fall through a portal and then pop out looking like Jennifer Morrison now, or what are we gonna do here? Apparently we're not planning on doing anything like that, so uh, whatever. Evangeline Lily, 
please stop being stupid. Thank you. But also, we've got Michelle Pfeiffer and Michael Douglas returning to the returning to the fold. Michael Douglas, who is kind of a badass, just for the fact that he does not watch Marvel movies that he's not in. So he had so he had no fucking clue what was going on when he started shooting Iron Man on the Wasp. He literally just was like, "What the hell happened to Germany?" And that's pretty. And that's kind of badass. Are yes. You, and of course, we've got Catherine Newton, who we've previously talked about in Detective Pikachu, and not much else because we haven't watched a lot of her other movies in theaters. But she, but ta- she will be taking on the role of Scott Lang's do- now grown daughter, Cassie Lang, who, in, who, if the t- trailers and everything else we are to believe about this movie is anything to go by, will probably be getting her powers as stature in this movie. Yes, but the big entry into this movie is the sort of return, sort of introduction of Kang the Conqueror played by the incomparable Jonathan Majors. We should probably open this by saying that we understand that Jonathan Majors is already already played him in Lo- played a version of Kang and Loki, but he's not playing the same character because the because he he who remains is a completely different character than Kang the Conqueror, which is why he who remains could just be Jonathan Major sitting in a chair, smiling, laughing, and being a clown, and using the clown training that he weirdly has. While Kang the Conqueror can be him doing over, can be him doing understated acting, talking in the typical villain villain voice of a voice. But, but the fact that he's even here, played by Jonathan Majors, just shows that Kevin Feige's way of getting actors in his movies is just essentially going to move. It's just essentially going to awards after shows and being like. You, you, you. Come with me. It's, a, and it's just insane to think. John, five years ago, Jonathan Majors was nobody. He had some small roles in things, but then he had Lovecraft Country and Devotion and Loki season two, and Loki season one finale and the Loki season one finale. And now suddenly he's everywhere. He went from being this guy was nowhere until he was everywhere. They. To the point that they were playing, that they played three trailers for movies that he was in in a row at tra- at plays in a, some movie theaters. Because he's doing this, he's doing Creed three, and he's got a bunch of other stuff. It's insane and almost inspiring the level at which this co- guy went from just a working act for five years. Just he didn't even really have the. Ba- have much in the way of paying his dues because he kind of got major role after major role. He just lucked his way into this career, but unfortunately, he has the talents to back it up. Though, of course, we should also talk about some of the talent behind the camera. Of course, Peyton Reed is coming back, comes back as the director, which is it's weird that the director of Bring It On is now suddenly play, you know, playing with multiversal, weird, crazy stuff because, once again, the director of Bring It On and various other just comedies that you wouldn't think that you wouldn't think oh this guy's got a we got a super awesome weird sci-fi slant to him when you just imagine 30 years ago telling someone watching the weird al show hey the guy who directed this episode this tv episode he's gonna direct this massive wizard of oz multiverse inspired hired movie involved starring michael douglas and michelle pfeiffer and then you would look at, and then they would punch you in the face because that was a stupid thing to think. You'd also probably tell them that, uh, tell them that it also stars that guy from Halloween Five. I think he was like, Hall- it was one of the Halloween, it was one of the Halloween remakes. Look, Paul Rudd before he was famous. <laughs> yeah. But, and of course, of course, this is the first Ant Man movie that uh, had had Paul Rudd will not be in he a, be a credited writer on. Instead, we have got Rick and Morty writer Jeff Loveness. Because, as we all know at this point, Karen Feige's method of finding people behind the camera is essentially walking into the Rick and Morty writers' room and being like, "Hey, whoever likes money, follow me. Not, not you, Justin. Not you. Why are you even in here? Nobody said you don't. You never. You're never in here. Why are you in here?" <laughs> Topical! Topical. But, yeah. This is another interesting story, sci-fi story in the MCU being told by a bunch of game filmmakers. But this one is not doing so well critically. It's, the low, it's now the lowest rated Rotten Tomatoes score of, a, or of an MCU movie. And that, and that kind of sucks because the Ant-Man movies have always been the lower stakes movies. Like, literally... 
the last movie was just kind of contained within these certain characters until the post credit scene that said, by the way, the world is ending uh, just off camera. The world is coming to an end. Yeah. But that's probably part of it. That's, that's probably part of it is that now we have an Ant-Man movie with state, with real world shattering stakes because we have the introduction of the guy who is going to be the main villain of the next two Avengers movies and will be kind of the puppet master of everything going on for the next few years of the MCU. And, yeah, I hope we like it. We typically like these movies, but still, it's just a case of, I don't know what the critics saw that they didn't like, but it's, like, I don't know, then again, I don't know what the critics saw that they didn't like in Multiverse of Madness or Thor 4 or... Like any movie that came out after Endgame, because anyone and, and that isn't called No Way Home, because I just like Marvel movies. I like the fact we that like we've got like, we like liking things. Damn it, we're allowed to like things. Comic book movies are, and in this case, comic book movies being comic books is just layering awesomeness on top of other awesomeness. Look at how great it is that we have this world like this, and. For the record, I am excited for James Gunn's DC slate because that's just taking it another step further. Granted, it's a little ballsy to kick it off like this instead of waiting to see how people like your products, but James Gunn, if anyone, has earned our trust at this point, so we... But, but we'll be talking about him next Marvel movie we talk about. Yeah, but for right now, I guess we'll see what happens. Whether this be a colorful train wreck or just another movie where the critics are critics were a little overzealous because they were like, "Oh, this is a weirder one. I can tear this apart now." So, do critics just not like sci-fi that. B movies anymore? I don't know. That's it's very weird because this was good. Yeah, I mean, do, do critics just not like it when the sci-fi movie when sci, when a typical sci-fi B movie plot has money and a good script behind it? I don't know. It's very interesting because that was a lot of fun in a lot of ways, including the fact that it's just a weird movie, and that's kind of what was good about it. It's weird. It's crazy. It's got these... It's a bit of a mess, but it still, but it still juggles most of its balls well until it eventually until eventually everything has to collapse in on its kind of collapse in on itself but then it but i think it recovers well yeah so let's get a little bit more into it peyton reed just makes a massive jump in directorial to in a directorial ambition simply because of the fact that this movie is just so freaking interesting to look at it's part, part of that is probably because you have Bill freaking Pope and Hope shooting the hell out of it. It's definitely something bigger than the other uh, uh, than the other two Ant Man movies. The other two Ant Man movies, we got glimpses of the quantum realm, but those were all just kind of normal, weird psychedelia imagery. But now we actually need to create a lived in world. And didn't we just see this damn movie? <laughs> yeah. I mean, from the visuals to the whole generational trauma thing, it feels like we just saw this movie a couple months ago yeah. with Strange World. And nobody went to see that, but this one's the one, number one movie in the world. <laughs> How's that fair? Well, then again, this one doesn't have any gay characters out in the open. Yeah, no, yeah not really. <laughs> but um, Paul Rudd, Evangeline Lilly, Michael Douglas, and Michelle Pfeiffer all... Everyone's is... back and and doing, we and doing well, but oh, uh, we got... Except, except for noticeably absent Michael Pena. Yeah. What, where is our Louise, guys? It's where is Louise explaining the plot of Endgame? So my friend, so my man Scotty, he was, he was stuck in the quantum realm for like five years, but it only felt like five hours to him. Then he, got, he was like, damn, bro, what happened while I was in there? <sighs> but uh, also we've got... But, they found a way to sneak David to Smolchin in as the more fun, as the actually funny version of that sketch from Saturday Night Live on the Adam Sandler episode a few years ago. Yes. And, uh, you know, and I really loved Catherine Newton in this because she just nailed being Paul Rudd. She was very, there's entire moments in this movie with Cassie where you're like, yeah, that's Scott's daughter. She very much has Paul Rudd's energy, and it's great because if you remember, because if you go back to our first video we ta ever talked about her in with in Detective Pikachu, I I mentioned how she talked exactly like an anime character in that. Well, here she talks, she acts exactly like Paul Rudd, 
and then uh, I guess in the I guess if you want to be technical with it, freaky she acted like Vince Vaughn did when he was playing the serial killer. Yeah, but she was really good in this, and we have. But the standout that everybody's talking about for good reason is Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. To give Kang the Conqueror a, sto a whole acting range where they got a really great charismatic actor who knows what he's talking about, who knows what he's doing, can build a character off of some kind of, off of all this, his energy, that this dark, foreboding energy where he's like, I have to be the one to do this because no one else has a chance of doing this. Yes, and Jonathan Majors holds that tragic past over her him. As well as the fact that uh, every time he that it's abundantly clear now that every time he's going to play Kang, he's going to play him in a completely different way. Yes, but we see what he do, but we see what Jonathan Majors does in the role and it's very exciting to see a completely different version of the character he played in Loki season 1 and now we can be excited because we got in about two years. We're gonna see him again. But the, there's also the but there's also the but once again, how did critics not th take that as being like, well, the movie is kind of a mess here and there, but the, but this is the performance of the saving grace. Anyways, I mean, we got Modok in this movie. We never thought we'd see Modok in this movie, and he's played by the most memorable actor of our time. Uh Fuck, what's his name? Uh, damn it, uh, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Tori something? Tori stole, idiots! Right. Thank you. Right, thanks, Pastor Spencer. Thank you for <laughs> screaming at us. Uh, but, yeah, this is, but yeah, we got MODOK in a movie, and yeah, it looks like crap, but it's MODOK. What did you expect? He's a gigantic fucking head with tiny little baby limbs. Yes. We're lucky we got something that I, we're lucky we got something that it wasn't radically altered. Yeah. We have all of this insane things to look at. It's so so interesting. Just every frame of this movie has something interesting going on. And, with the, and we have so many practical characters like, and they could have just gone and it would have been so easy for them to be like, just take some extras from Thor and Guardians and just put them in the background. Nobody's going to notice or care. But each single creature we see all throughout the quantum realm is a completely different character we have never see, really seen in the MCU. Actually, now that I think about it, I think I might have seen one of the Ravagers from, from, from Guardians sitting in the in what could pass for this version, the movie's version of the cantina scene, but, we'll, but that's you know, neither here nor there. Yeah, because... Because we have to keep in mind that the quantum realm is different from outer space. So, so I like the, the fact that they put in effort to have all of these unique creatures that don't look like, that, tr that at least try not to look exactly like the stuff in Guardians and Thor, in the Guardians of the Galaxy and Thor movies. And also, William Jackson Harper is in this movie, and I am disappointed in you, good place fans, for constantly bringing up time, the time knife, but never bringing up somebody catch my tiny flying boyfriend. Especially since he is a tiny, he is tiny in this movie. Shame, 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 shame. <laughs> anyway, Christoph Beck is going a bit into the levels of. Of, I'm just gonna bust out my old synthesizer and play that that Mark Mothersbaugh did when he scored Duke for the or the Ragnarok. Yes, and uh, so occasionally it'll be this big epic sweeping score, and all, and then uh, it'll just be like, and then we go into the heavy synths because this is a trippy movie, and once again, it's basically a B movie, a sci-fi B movie from way, way, way back. But when Kang gets involved, then suddenly the score kicks up. And we get all of this awesome choral vocals and uh, the choral stuff and all this other stuff. It's insane. It's just this. Uh, it's just this fun, weird movie. It's a little messy. There, it feels like there's a few, like it, like when they separate the character, when they start to separate the characters that into separate parties from the parties they already started out as. So now there's like, like seven different plots juggling around. It feels like that's when it starts to get a little narratively jumbled but especially since it seems there's a lot of there's chunks of it where it's like you're just you're clearly just more to use in this side you don't have to do a lot of exposition with Kang later 
but all, but it, but in the end, I think it sticks the landing just simply because it remembers to be it remembers to be the fun kind of crazy. And yeah, it does kind of steal a few tricks from Rick and Morty, but what do you expect? Jeff Loveness is going to write what he knows, and you can he tell. spent a, and he spent a good three years of his life writing on Rick and Morty, so he's going to so he's probably going to be like, oh, I'm just going to throw a couple gags from season two in there. Like you can see, like in the same way that you can tell with Michael Waldron stuff for the MCU, you can tell that Jeff Loveness's work here is very much taking cues from his work on Rick and Morty. Not that that's a bad thing. If we're gonna, if Rick and Morty is going to influence anything, it should definitely be the style of storytelling and not the style of, not the messed up, quasi improvisational style that just, that made Justin Roiland the biggest thing in the world until he became, until everyone decided that they were annoyed by him. And then, and then everybody found out about him and realized he was the, the biggest piece of shit on the planet. One of them. One of the biggest pieces of shit on the planet. But yeah, uh, otherwise. Ant-Man, Quantum Mania, it might be the best Ant-Man movie. I think I'm going to remember it a little bit more than Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, than, the first, than the second one. It's hard to say put, hey, where it ranks in the Ant-Man franchise. This, it, in the franchise as a whole, this is, pro, this is obviously going to be mandatory viewing for anybody, in the, for anybody who's trying to keep up with this stuff. Obvi obviously, no one's gonna put a gun to your head and tell you that you have to go see every Marvel movie that comes out. But but if you want, but if you're trying to see everything, you're gonna have to see it. You're gonna be seeing this anyway. And it's not like it's a bad sit. It's less than two hours. It fe it it, do it feels a little long. It feel it does feel a little long, but it's also, but also there's just so much fun stuff to uh, thrown at the walls. All that you just kind of and are like, okay, this is feeling a little long, but also I'm kind of he still here for the ride. But I'm also still here for the ride. Just keep showing me what you got. There's still stuff that could be used, and the Quantum Realm is still around as a concept, so we could come back to that eventually if they decide they want... If anybody in Marvel wants decides they want to go and do something with that. But for right now, it, now this is just an, this is just another great, ver good, maybe good, maybe great, maybe not great. I don't know. It's... So Maybe it's another it's, into, it's maybe B plus sliding into it's maybe like a B minus sliding into a C plus territory with this one but this but it's definitely better than Thor the Dark World for right as our opinion stands right now yeah. and it's how uh, and I think that we're that the Marvel universe has still got some gas in the tank it's I mean, a Marvel movie I mean the fact that they're still taking chances right now is really exciting makes what the MCU is doing now really exciting but then again, and we're still waiting. We we're still sitting in the theater, bawling our eyes out at the trailer for Guardians Volume Three. So we'll see how that goes in a couple of months. But for right now, we're we Ant Man is fine. It's not the it's not the best movie in the MCU, but it's probably never going to be be considered the worst. Or especially when so many people have been holding on to uh, on to Iron Man Two and Thor Two as their least favorites. What's the but especially with the fact that we have these, we have promise of more great content coming our way with these amazing with these characters. With so, I think we'll just keep going with that promise. And be sure to and that's it for us right now, guys. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to tune in next time when it's a bear on cocaine. Bye.